Okay, it's, it's my really great pleasure to introduce next speaker, Bill Thurston. I was told that I have to be very brief. So, in brief, Bill introduced the all-encompassing geometrization conjecture. His work on geometrization completely revolutionized hyperbolic geometry, three-manifold topology, low-dimensional topology. In the course of his, his work on geometrization, he generated an incredible number of, of original ideas. And, and through that, he created many different new subfields of mathematics. And he revolutionized or, or re-energized many other subfields of mathematics, all these subfields distinct from geometrization. Bill also has contributed to many other parts of mathematics. He's been tremendously in influential outside of geometrization. In particular, he's done extraordinary work in foliations, uh, rational maps, contact structures. So anyway, it's my pleasure to welcome Bill Thurston. Thank you, thank you. Um, um, this is just a hyperbolic polyhedron. We're going to switch. There's my. You can hear me now, can't you? We. Okay. I'm not used to using Keynote, but I'm going to try to use it. Play slideshow. Okay. So I think. I think um, a lot of what, a lot of mathematics is really about how you understand things in your head. I mean, it's people that do mathematics. It's, we're, we're not just sort of general purpose machines. We're people, and we, we see things, we feel things, we think of things. Um, so. I think a lot, of, a lot of what I did, a lot of what I have done in my mathematical career has had to do with finding new ways to, well, build models, to see things, do computations, anyway, to get really a feel for stuff. And, you know, it may seem unimportant, but, you know, when I started out, people drew pictures of three manifolds one way, and I started drawing them a different way. People drew pictures of surfaces one way, I started drawing them a different way. Um, there's something, I mean, there's something significant about how the representation in your head changes, profoundly changes how you, how you think. Now, it's very hard to do a, you know, a brain dump. To, to, um, um, it's very hard to do that, I'm, I'm, but I'm still going to try to do something to give a feel for three manifolds. You know, words are one thing. We can talk about geometric structures. There are many precise mathematical words that can be used, but they don't automatically convey a feeling for it. I probably can't convey a feeling for it either, but I want to try. That's what I want to try. Okay, so we now have a, we, do, we have a very, Strong, clear, beautiful picture for three manifolds. There's a, um, uh, every three manifold has a decomposition into canonical geometric pieces. This is very, um, well, we've sort of known this was, this had to be true for many years. At least I felt it had to be true. And other people gradually started believing in it. Not everybody. And Perelman's, Perelman's proof really seals it. So. Um, it's sort of established for the mathematical world. It gives us a, a place to, it's both, as, every, as many people have said, it's a, both a stopping place, it's the end of an era, but it's also the beginning of something. It gives us a platform for going ahead. We don't have to now hedge everything we say in terms of, 
Well, if the geometrization conjecture is true, then blah, 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 or every, I mean, there, you know how it goes. That when, when there's something not quite established, the Riemann hypothesis or, or whatever, people believe it's probably true, but it's not established, then everything is, um, everything is hypothetical. Everything is, uh, uh, people talk about different kinds of things. Once, once something is rigorously established, then you go on, people go on to do more things. What are we going to go on to do? It's very hard to predict. That's one thing I've learned in mathematics. I thought I would know what was coming next, and it would be completely in a different direction. But, um, but still, it's good to try to understand a little bit of what, um, what it is. I want to start, though, by just going over one little, I mean, the ge so, so this geometric decomposition is very clear, very, um, it's very straightforward in a sense, but it's more complicated than people easily absorb in a casual encounter. Um, and, well, it's very easy to hear about it without understanding it. So I want to I wanna go over um, one, one microcosm, one, one world, one little mathematical world that contains all the phenomena in the, ge in the geometrization conjecture, all, all eight geometries and both decompositions. And, um, and it's, it's a world that you can actually see and get a direct intuition for without some you know, complicated indirect calculation. It's very important that you see it. You know, if, if you plug numbers into a computer and do a computation and it says something, it gives you a very different understanding. It's not the same answer as if you see something. So we begin by just thinking of um, a, a sort of a magical circle, a loop that um, doubles the world. So we, ha we have a loop here. And when you, when you pass through the world, um, suddenly you're in the United States and the coffee is um, <laughs> brown colored water. <laughs> you, go, you go through the loop again and we're back in Paris and you know, the coffee means something. <laughs> and if you want to go back, you can go back and we're back in the US and okay, anyway. So the world branches like this. If you went to Gis's lecture, um, um, he, he, he um, what's the right word? He, he did this to Poincaré repeatedly. He, he created a doubled world where um, Poincaré, we branched copies of Poincaré in, in, in more and more complicated ways. I'm going to do much the same thing, but in three dimensions. I didn't have the... I didn't have the time and energy to put in a three-dimensional Poincaré here to, to show you, but you can imagine someone for yourself. Or maybe that joke got worn out last night. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, so the, but you think of the basic universe as the three-sphere. The three-sphere, we think of as all of space, but we make it small by doing the one-point compactification, but a single point of infinity. So, you know, you, you start out going in this direct, go in any direction, you go far away enough and you, you reach the point at infinity. If you can continue in a straight line, you come back the other direction. Um, I don't mean the projective completion. That's different. This is the, I'm talking about the spherical completion, the one-point compactification. Okay, so we can, we can um, now do this with other designs, not just a round circle. Oh, if you take the brand, if you do it, if you double the sphere, the three sphere around this round circle, um, you get the three sphere again. You can think of just, I mean, just as we saw in Jesus' talk, we can just think of um, a symmetry of the sphere. If this is a great circle, you can rotate the three sphere around the great circle, and if you rotate by an angle of pi, and rotate by an angle of pi again, you come back. So the rotation by angle of pi is an element of order two, and, it, um, and the, the quotient by that symmetry gives the three sphere, and conversely, the, the, sort of the square root process, the inverse branch function, branching around the axis, gives the three sphere. 
But, but we can try it with um, other more complicated figures. Here's the, um, here are the Borromean rings. This is a famous um, link. Um, and and you, there, there are two ways to think of it. Either think of, think of creating this branch cover, or just think of these links as creating a singularity in the geometry of space where a, a cross section, a cross section to the link is like a, is like a cone. It's like a standard, well, it's like a cone you get by taking a piece of half a, a sheet of paper and um, take a sheet of paper and bend, bend it two halves together to make a, to make a cone, a, a cone with a t total 180 degree cone angle. So we can, we can think of just geometrically distorting space like that. If you do that, you know, it'll, it'll, the metric will look kind of ugly. But space has a, the three sphere has a beautiful metric, which is distorted by the cone angle, by that cone angle along these axes. Um, if you've seen the movie Not Not, it tried to give a feel for that, um, to, just as a stepping stone to trying to get a feel for how it works, um, you can, the Borromean rings can be rearranged in either of these two forms. You can, imagine, you can think of, well, you can take three ellipses with their long axes and short axes, um, all different. And um, th this arrangement of ellipses can be changed into the arrangement of um, three circles. Now, on this arrangement of, of ellipses, I've, I've drawn in some two-dimensional ellipses. You can think of that as giving a spine, a spine for the um, three-sphere minus, well, with those axes. In other words, everything outside those things, all of space outside those axes can collapse into the, um, it can collapse down and fill all the crevices. So it's the, the outside of these, so if you drew a ball in the three-sphere, could sort of turn inside out. So, so the, anyway, you can think of it taking a sphere and just collapsing it down to here. If you, if you now think of the opposite process, inflate, think of a paper construction made of two, two faces for each of, the, each of the ellipses, and they're joined just the way you see them. The, 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 visible, the visible faces are joined. Um, I don't have it as a live model here, so I'll just talk about it. If you inflate it, can you see a cube? This will inflate into a cube. Particularly, if, if, you think of making, if you think of making those axes, as I said, with a 180-degree cone angle, so it's like each of the axes is like taking half of space and folding it in half. So when you inflate it, it just, um, it just opens out and makes it flat, and it will become a cube. Um, here's a picture of, the, of a cube. It's a, well, a little not centered, but... Um, I'll go back and forth a little bit. I should have put these on the same page, but um, so just imagine, imagine a paper model with a little hole where you can puff some air. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and it, makes, it turns it into this cube. And now the cube, with the cube, you can, you, this is part of a, of a repeating crystallographic arrangement in three space. So if you take three space with three sets of parallel axes, a set of axes evenly spaced like this, then an interleaving set of parallel axes like this, so they, they don't intersect, and then that creates holes where you can make another set of axes going down as it's drawn. If you take a cube, as big a cube as you can that doesn't cross those axes, it will, it will intersect the axes just as in the picture. So there's a, there's a group of symmetries involved in space. If you start with these axes, you can think of the symmetry, which is 180 degree rotation about any axis. Or, um, or, or you're here and you're like that. 
or, um, well, <laughs> you have imaginations. I would do it if I thought you didn't. <laughs> Yeah, you can, so there's three, there's three kinds of symmetries. You can do the symmetries about any action, any axis. If, if you start composing those, you get more symmetries. But um, this will act transitively on the spaces between the axes. Each, each cube can be sent to another cube, any other cube, in a, in a unique way. So, so if you take space with this crystallographic group, and form the quotient by the action. So you identify all points that are, are, are equivalent under the action. You will get the, um, topologically, you'll get the three sphere with the Borman rings as the image of the singular act, locus. And if you, had, you know, if you had some crystallized molecule with this crystallographic group, you could draw a diagram if you wanted. In, in, in here with, um, you know, the, ba the fundamental atoms would be aligned either on the axes or in between them, and, um, and you could, you know, you could figure out the structure from, from this quotient picture, just as you could figure out the repeating structure here. Okay, so that's one example of a, of a geometric structure in this um, microcosm world. This is a little a little special case of the geometrization conjecture. One, I mean, I'm doing, I'm calling them orifold slash two. They have only cone axes with order, only order two cone axes. I'm always, I'm only just using the underlying space as the three sphere, and this is what we get. This is the kind of thing we get. Okay. Okay. Um, here's another example of a geometric structure. A little, a little bit more complicated than um, Euclidean space. This is a picture. I, actually, I, you know, I was reading um, Poincaré's works. I mean, I was reading what he wrote about topology, and he described this picture. And you know, he, I, I, he didn't draw the picture, but but this is the picture that he he evoked. Um, and I was I was kind of amazed when I. Read it. So this is this is called nil geometry, right? Yeah, you know, we call it nil geometry. So think of. So here you can think of space with an affine group of symmetries. So you can. With this picture, this nil geometry, or Heisenberg jungle gym. Um, so you can go up. If you, if you go up one unit, it's exactly the same. If you go over a union, unit, everything's tilted, but it's tilted in a very predictable way. So when, um, when, when, when you go from here, you just shear downwards, shear downwards. And similarly, when you go over, um, well, I'm going over this way, I shear upwards. So there's, there's a group of transformations going um, right and left, forward and back, and up and down. They're not preserving the Euclidean geometry, but they're preserving some other kind of geometry, um, this Heisenberg geometry or nil geometry. This is another one of the, this is another one of the eight three-dimensional geometries. It doesn't actually occur very often, but it occurs, and it's important in understanding the whole picture. It's important to understand the special cases as well as the main cases. So this is one of the special cases. Um, nil geometry, and this and the quotient. Well, I wasn't. I wasn't totally careful to draw the picture that corresponds to this picture. But here's an example of uh, a link in the three sphere, where, where you, if you think of this link divided by two with order two cone axes, it it has a nil geometry structure, and. You know, rather than all these things, they're possible to carry out in detail, but in a way, the bigger point is to try to be able to squint your eyes and sort of kind of get the feel for it. I mean, you won't get the exact feel for it just if you haven't seen it before, just on one glance. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and forth. These, these axes here, these, all, all four circles, 
correspond to, um, whoops, sorry. All four circles correspond to the vertical lines. All that's, all that's drawn are the um, vertical lines. And um, there, there's a weird thing. If you look at these vertical lines, the, the figure has, um, it has order two, you can do an order two rotation about any of the vertical lines. But, but now, if I, take, um, if I take the four posts surrounding a square, and I, I rotate 180 degrees about one, and 100, I, I progress around the thing, if I was doing that in Euclidean space, doing those four rotations would get me back exactly how I started. It would be the identity. But when I do this, I sort of, I sort of drift upward. So, um, so the group generated by four rotations around four adjacent posts is actually has a compact quotient. And the, the four posts, in other words, there's a kind of warping here. The posts are warped with respect to each other. And, and you can see that here. I mean, I, yeah, I could have drawn this picture that make, making it, emphasizing that. It, it would, would have been better, better rather than a flat picture to draw a sort of vertical picture where these four posts sort of go around and sort of twist before they come back. It's the same, it's the same thing. But they're like four posts with a warped relation. But, um, but in fact, there's a, these are four hot circles. They're part of the famous hot vibration of the three sphere of the two sphere. And so, so you can actually, there's actually a rigid motion. There's an isometry of the three sphere that sort of rotates these four circles along, along themselves and rotates space around them at the same time. And um, if, you, if you take the quotient of the three sphere by that circle group action, by you know, the, the motion that rotates all those four circles simultaneously, the quotient will be, well, it'll be a two sphere where the four axes become four special singular points. So, the, so this, is a, this is a three orbifold that fibers over the two, 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 um, two dimensional orbifold. I mean, just to show I could, well, I'm not even sure I put all the slides in for all the geometries. We can do some of these quickly. Here's, here's a link that, whose geometry gives a um, two dimensional sphere across a line. If you just take two, in fact, that would work too if I just took two disjoint circles, but it's, it's sort of boring. Um, it's like we have the, if you have these two gates, you know, this one goes from Paris to New York and back again. This one goes from Paris to Moscow or St. Petersburg and back again. And, but then if you go, you know, if I go around through this one and then come over from through this one, you don't know where you'll get. It might be someplace else. So, so you start considering all the combinations and you can you end up having an infinite number of possibilities. And that's like a line, a line direction in this geometry. I just put in this linking sphere to make it look slightly athletic or to make it, I don't know. Anyway, it's a sphere across the line geometry. Um, here's, a, here's a link which gives solved geometry. Um, I think I have a picture of this. Yeah, here's, here's a, another picture. I, um, again, Conquer A. I learned about this geometry from Poincaré once again. Um, so you can consider space with, we have a group of translations going this way, a group of translations going this way. And now we have a strange thing that you go from this level up to the um, higher level. And the, the, um, the grid of um, city blocks gets distorted so they longer this way and shorter this way. Um, anyway, I think, I think this is the 2111 map. Oh no, it's the Fibonacci, Fibonacci map. But um, 0111. Anyway, um, anyway, as you go upward, everything gets very elongated in, in this direction. As you go downward, everything gets very elongated in the perpendicular direction. 
I like to think of this as a, a system for constructing freeways. I mean, not, not that I advocate it, but it, it, it's a description of a system for freeways where if you want to go a very long distance, um, you, you, you go up you go up till the roads are going super fast in one of the coordinates you want to traverse, then you go along those roads, then you come down, and if you, go, you go down below where you started, and the roads go super fast in the other direction, and you come up, and um, anyway, the, in, in this horizontal plane, you can, the, the, the dis, within, this, within this graph, within this picture, the distances in the horizontal plane are, are proportional to the log of the Euclidean distance. And in fact, this particular design is, um, I mean, really for that reason, this particular design is very close to designs that are used for um, switching networks and com in telephone systems and, and uh, networks of parallel computers and so forth. It's, um, they all seem to be closely related to this, this particular kind of geometry. So this is. So solve geometry has a certain solve is somehow an appropriate word. I mean, it originally meant it had to be a sol it was a solvable Lie group, which is simpler than other kinds of groups. But it's also good at solving solving problems. And that um, th there's a theorem that if I take an arbitrary graph of finite valence, I can quasi isometrically embed it, quasi uniformly embed it in this with only a sort of a logarithmic expansion, you know, expanded by the log of the number of nodes. Anyway, and here's an example of a link, which when you unwrap it, when you, 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 bran you unbranch the space around this, um, you branch space around this link, it gives soft geometry, where um, you can think of the the, the curve here is on one horizontal level. The curve up there is on another horizontal level. And these, um, this, the weaving back and forth it stands for the vertical lines. And, and there's kind of a, you can kind of see if you take the loop at the bottom and push it up to the top, it gets twisted around as measured by the top. And, one can actually continue doing that, and it gets more and more twisted. That's very like the um, solved geometry. It's very like this picture here. Now, again, I don't expect you to get this in detail, but I'm just trying to say there's an intuitive relationship. You can learn to look at this, and you see it's like this. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of techniques to help do that, but here's just a random example of a Another one of the um, eight geometries, um, this, this is uh, like, like the others I've said, talked about so far, this is based on um, two-dimensional hyperbolic geometry, sort of extended, is it based on a two-dimensional picture, but extended one dimension higher. Um, it's, it has to do with, you can think of it as describing the set of, um, um, a set of positions of a ship sailing on a hyperbolic sea. Or, so it's a unit tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane. This is kind of geometry. And these are just five hop circles, five circles of the hop vibration. If I, um, there's a kind of, again, there's a, there's a motion, a, a continuous motion of the three sphere where I can think of just continuously rotating all the circles all at the same time, and it extends to the space around it. They, they all sit on the surface of a torus, the way they're drawn. You can think of rotating the torus this way and rotating the torus this way at the same time. And the circles go to themselves. And the, the orbit space of that action, the quotient space, well, is topologically a two-sphere with five circles. It'll actually look like two copies of a pentagon in some sense. If, so in the hyperbolic plane, you can take a, there are right-angled pentagons you can make. If you take two right-angled pentagons and sew their edges together, it makes a, you can think of like a pillowcase, a pentagonal pillowcase. And, and this is just, and you can think of the circles as just 
describing, uh, of course, this pentagonal pillowcase is a two-dimensional surface. But if you think of the set of all, um, all directions, so your kid takes a pen and marks on it all possible ways. It makes little marks. This is not just theoretical. Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway the, the possible ways to mark, there's a three-dimensional set of tangent vectors to this pillowcase. And this is, this is its, well, this is related to its picture. It's not exactly the picture. That's, it's good enough right now. Um, it's a very similar thing. Another, this, is, this geometry is related to the hyperbolic plane cross a line. Um, okay, this knot is um, one of the very simplest ones where, which, where the, um, the orbifold, the, you divide it by two, or, ta or take the twofold universal fence cover, and it's hyperbolic. I won't say it's the simplest, because that would depend how you define simplest. But, um, but it's one of the simplest. And, um, and really, it's the generic behavior. All these other things I've talked about so far are very, very special cases. If you take a sort of generic thing, a typical, very tangled knot, it tends to have a hyperbolic p description, or depending what you define as a random knot, it would have a, it might tend to have some um, small little pieces that have other kinds of geometry, but the bulk of it, the big component would be hyperbolic. Um, now, can I show you why it's hyperbolic? So I, uh, this, the complement of this is an amazing kind of um, geometry. I, I felt inspired to try to build a spine for it by hand. I don't think you can really appreciate it from these photographs, but that's what it is. Um, you, you should think of taking these. These are five. Um, well, they're they're triangles plus half of a tengon, and there's one more tengon you should really put in the middle, but um, it doesn't show. Anyway, um, here's the. Here's the um, fundamental domain, the Dirichlet domain for this group acting in hyperbolic three space. If I'd, if I'd been more organized or had more time, um, I would have um, shown it more. Let's see, I need the, this is GeomView, which all, all, a lot of this software um, used to work better than it does now, using, using um, no. I want the cameras. I want to go back into the, um, shoot, the, the window's smaller than I was. Uh, uh, yeah, I can ch change it back to the conformal model. Here, I mean, this is, this is what it looks like. This is what the fundamental domain for that universal, you know, for that Turk's head knot looks like inside hyperbolic space when you unwrap it. Um, so, the, so it's made of, um, Let's see, the, it's actually a regular hyperbolic. There, there is a form which is a regular hyperbolic polyhedron. I'm not sure it's still regular here, because some of these operations might have distorted it a little bit. There are many choices for the fundamental polyhedron. But it's made of, um, it's a truncated dodecahedron. You start with a, a regular 12-sided figure, and then cut off the, um, cut off the faces by cut off neighborhoods of vertices by triangles. So, so the faces are 10 gons in triangles. Um, to, to glue it up, to give the Turk's head knot, you actually take each, you take, well, there are two of the, two of the 10, 10 gon faces, like the one, this red one here and this other red one here, which, um, which is joined together. If you, if you join, if you sort of, if you, you can think of taking the figure topologically and joining those two together, it'll make a solid torus. And the, the solid torus, you got, oops, I have to go back to the, where is it? Keynote, I have to go back to, here, the solid torus you got is, um, is the complement of this 
figure I've drawn. And then all the other faces, if you, fold, you can actually fold them up in space, and it'll, it'll create this spine where the cone axes create, uh, go to the red axes of the spine. Um, anyway, it's just one example. This is one example of um, how, how you know, a, a knot or a link gives the surprise, I mean, there's a sort of canonical geometry associated with it. The, the, there's no choices about the geometry of the orbifold or manifold you get. And, and it's often very surprising and striking. Um, this is a slide I meant to have later. So we'll come back to it. Um, now, I've talked about most of the geometries. I'm not sure I mentioned all of them. It does, it's not important because m most of them are minor geometries. I just wanted to give a flavor. The main geometry is hyperbolic geometry. But there's also two decomposition theorems to really understand three manifolds and, and this microcosm of these slash two orbifolds. So one is the prime decomposition. Um, this is something well known in knots. I mean, when you learn to tie a square knot, you tie an overhand knot, and then you tie another overhand knot. That's the square knot is the sum, the, the sum of the overhand knot plus the overhand knot. To recognize when something is, a, is, 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 is not prime, the question is whether there's a two-sphere that intersects the knot or link in exactly, well, in, in no points or two points. If it's connected, you can't have it, I mean, if it intersects in no points, then it's a trivial two-sphere, it doesn't matter. If, if the link, yeah. A anyway, um, so here, here's an example where there's a two-sphere indicated by the red line where you, um, it intersects in two points. In the prime decomposition, when you find one of those, you then join the loose ends and you get two simpler knots. And the nice, theorem is that um, even though you might, you might find different ways to cut it, but when you get pieces that can't be cut anymore, the set of pieces of a knot you get are canonically determined by the original knot. The prime sum ends are, are uniquely determined. Um, and I won't go through that theory. <sighs> okay. Now, there's another decomposition which um, John Conway pioneered the tangle decomposition of a knot. So to, to understand the tangle decomposition, you look for two spheres that intersect the knot or link in four points, like, like I've shown here. Um, and the theory is somewhat more complicated, also somewhat simpler. Um, so so to, to do the tangle decomposition, if you find a, a sphere that intersects in four points, you, um, you get four loose ends. There are lots of possible ways to join up four loose ends. You could join them like this, you could join them like this, or you could shh, do a big twist and join them like this, or you could, you, know, you could twist this way, twist this way, twist this way. There are infinitely many ways to join them up. So, what do you do? You give up. I mean, you. You just put them all in a point. You gather them all to a point. And, and you sort of almost inevitably led to this new concept where, where now instead of having just a knot or a link, we have, we'll also have vertices where four strands come together. And we think of the vertex as just a, a, a locus that's ready to implant another tangle. So, so you might put a little overhand knot or uh, there's, again, a, a nice collection of ways. The, the set of possible ways to do it are described by elements of the rational projective line, or actually, you know, a pair of relatively prime integers up to sign is a way to say it. And again, um, again, there's a canonical aspect to this. If you, um, you might find more than one different way to cut it, a, a knot into tangles, and um, but the answers you get are, um, are, are the same if you define it correctly. Okay. 
Okay, so um, that's the theory. This, this is a very, very powerful theory, this tangle theory. I'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, so um, there, there's sort of a, so one of the directions, I think, it's just begging to be developed better is, is the issue of computation of three manifolds. So we have some computational tools for three manifolds that are, are just remarkably effective if you understand the tools and how to use them. They, um, they work very quickly. I'll show you, I'll show you in a minute um, one, of, one of them. Um, on the other hand, there are, many, um, there are many ways to ask questions about three manifolds that are sort of fit into the, well, they're known to be NP-complete, or they're known to be you know, very hard to answer. And so it depends somewhat what, what questions you're asking, what, how, how easy it is to compute. But the most important questions might be, give, we have the, some topological description of a three-manifold. Can we canonically identify it, given two three-manifolds? Are they homeomorphic? And it's not known, but it appears to be that they're probably you know, quite efficient algorithms that work. But, um, I mean, in practice, they're very efficient algorithms that work. But, um, but why? And how do they work? And do they always work? Those are, the, those are questions that are not adequately, have never adequately been addressed. I mean, it's easy to prove there are algorithms that do work, but the only proofs I know about involve these sort of doubly exponential things, or they quote the, you know, the solvability of, you know, it's known that the elementary theory of real numbers is solvable by, Tarski proved this amazing theorem, and, but the algorithms are very bad. But for three manifolds, the algorithms seem to be very work, good. So, you know, the, I think the, you know, the central focus of this, this emanated from SnapP, which is a program Jeff Weeks um, uh, began as a PhD student. He was sort of kind of thinking of dropping out because he didn't think he was set to be a research mathematician, but um, he went off to teach at a, at a college, a, a teaching college for a year. But, you know, he, but, but I thought Snap P was worthy, worthwhile as a central point of a thesis. So, um, so anyway, that, that, he wrote a thesis surrounding that, and then he's developed it a lot ever since. And then a lot of other people, too, have helped and written other programs and et cetera, et cetera. But um, a lot of it comes back to Snap P. Let's see if I have the, yeah. So the, unfortunately, the, oh, shoot, this is, this is distorted here. Um, you know, I'm going to try something. I'm going to quit this. I'm, and I'm going to restart it and see if it gets a better, um, a better perspective, because this is a run. OK. This is an emulator of a very old-fashioned Macintosh. I see it's, it's distorted in this. It doesn't understand the display, so we'll just deal with it. Um, the, so this is an example of a program that it was faster 20 years ago than it is now, but um, <laughs> someday, I mean, there, there are other modern versions that are quite fast, but they don't have the same nice user interface. Um, so let me see if I can do this. I wasn't expecting, um, no, come on. Do we have new link projection? Okay, we'll, we'll try this anyway, under, under duress. I could go to the, I could go to a modern version of Snap P, but, um, so basically, I can draw a knot or a link. I'll just draw something. I'll, I'll, I'll just put in a few circles, come on. Close it up. I'll, I'll draw another one. I, w I want it to be not too complicated because, because the, 
the program is inefficient running in this. Um, 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 this old, this Motorola, I mean this emulator for an old chip, it's not even the, anyway, um, I'm going to make it alternate. Now I can, so th here's an example of a, um, a not, a link, not terribly complicated, but not terribly simpler, simple. Now I'll ask it to um, find a hyperbolic structure. It did. Its volume is 29.15859582288284, as you can read. It's possible, of course, to compute this as accurately as you like. Um, um, so so that, that's a unique topological invariant of the knot, but, um, but volume, volume of a link complement is not a, does not uniquely characterize the link, um, give, given a certain volume, given a certain value for volume, there's only a finite number of possible different links with that volume, but we don't know what they are. We don't know what the values of volume are, and we don't know what the um, set of volumes are. I think tomorrow we'll hear from Dave Gabay about that we now know what the lowest volume for a hyperbolic figure out of what is, but in general, it's a very difficult question. However, there are combinatorial, there is combinatorial information to do it. I mean, what I wanted to show, the, this, is, this is a different metaphor, this is a different world now. In the, in the notation where I was talking about um, knots divided by um, two to, before, here it's a, this is a knot divided by infinity. So it's computed a hyperbolic structure where you can think of making it a, the, the not into an order three cone axis, an order four cone axis, da 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 da, order a million cone axis, and there's a limit as n goes to as a million goes to infinity, um, where the knot itself is infinitely far away. So there's a metric in space. There's a metric on the three sphere, which is hyperbolic. It's a metric on the complement of the knot, everything but the knot. The knot is a singularity, like a it's infinitely far away, but, but the neighborhoods of it get really, really thin. They sort of decrease. They're like toruses going around the knot shrink exponentially fast as you go toward the knot in the metric. So, so the, this metric has a finite volume. It's a complete metric of finite volume with, um, with very standard cusps. One invariant, one invariant for the knot is... Um, um, is the shape of the cusps. Um, um, unfortunately, these are going to be distorted by an affine transformation, but there they are. Um, oh, you can't, you can't see it very well, but um, these toruses, these toruses are just all, all similar toruses, but they shrink. So, so the shape is well defined, just the, um, the size is not. And, and these are the shapes. They're kind of long and skinny. That's typical for um, alternating knots like this is. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of theory about what the shape can be. And that, that's, again, a topological invariant of the link complement. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can... Um, I'm going to see if it's... This emulator is good enough to compute the cusp neighborhoods. This used to be, you know, quick. Or on a modern, there it is, okay. It's going to do it. I, I'm going to, um, I'll show you another view that, that gives you an idea of why there's a um, canonical combinatorial picture. You have to imagine. These may look like circles here, but they're real. I mean, they may look like ellipses, but they're actually circles. From my point of view, they look like circles, actually. Um, so this picture is a canonical, again, a canonical function of the topology of that link complement. Um, there's, a, there's some combinatorial information. No, sorry. There's some combinatorial information that goes with it, um, namely the... Um, Forward domain, 
here it shows it. Um, and I'll, I'll show the parallelogram too. So you can think of, um, I have to shrink it so we can see it all in one picture. OK, there's a, the, you can see, a, I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a parallelogram in the picture. The parallelogram is meant to be identified to a torus. And this torus stands for the, a torus going around the, the blue link component in the original picture. Um, um, there it is. So if you, if you make it, oh, the redisplay is painful. Anyway, if, if you make a little torus going around the blue link component and a little torus going around the red link component, and you think of inflating them, blow, blow air into this one, blow air into this one until they touch, um, they, they will, um, they will, um, they will touch on, um, I'm sorry, they will touch on those parallelograms. I'm going to um, take away the horribles just so you can see it. There's a combinatorial pattern where they touch. I haven't shown the red one, but they, they touch in the same way. So again, this combinatorial gluing pattern is a, is a canonical function. It's a canonical combinatorial function of the knot. Any other, if you, if you, if you distorted this knot, drew it any other way, or embedded it in his face in any other way, um, this pro, well, snap P would find exactly the same picture. And you can recognize and totally identify the, um, the, the manifold by that pattern. And this is quite general. OK. So I've said some of this already. Um, the, the, way, the way these algorithms actually work is by starting with the knot, um, finding a combinatorial decomposition into what we call ideal tetrahedra. They're like tetrahedra with, one, with all their vertices missing. Their vertices are kind of spiraling toward the knot. And then it turns out the shape of an ideal tetrahedron is very simple to describe. You can determine it by a single complex number associated with any particular edge. It's like an angle. It's very much like an angle, the generalization of the angle of a triangle. And the three, there's an easy formula to get from one pair of opposite edges to the other three pairs of opposite edges. And then there's simple gluing equations that the product of these numbers going around any edge has to equal one, because it has to match up. And, um, and then snap p and similar programs work just by numerically solving for when the gluing equations are true. And what seems miraculous is that these, that they almost always converge. I mean, why should they? These are equations with, I mean, as soon as they get a complicated knot, you know, each, each crossing kind of multiplies the degree of the, if you wrote it as a single polynomial equation, it, you know, multiplies the degree by two or something like that. So do 100 crossings, it would be degree two to the hundredth. It's an algebraic equation. It's, you know, certainly algorithmically solvable. We're looking for one particular solution, but zoop, we zip right to it with these programs. How many? Just a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me give the rest of my talk. So they're good serial numbers. I think there has to be something more going on, and somebody needs to figure out what it is. Um, so, so in practice, we have really good ways to identify three manifolds. Um, there, are, there are a lot of other mysteries remaining, so I just want to touch on them quickly. In the, I, sh I should have my time here, but um, I don't actually have a watch. Um, so one of them is another. There are many structures associated with three manifolds. One of them is the fields, the algebraic and the information in the number theory. So any hyperbolic three manifold is associated with an algebraic number field, canonically associated with that field. And I mean, there's more algebraic data as well, but let's just start with the field. And there's just a basic question that what fields 
arise in this way. The, there's an easy statement that the field has to have at least one complex place. So it, and, and anything that has exactly one pla complex place occurs as an arithmetic three-manifold. But there are lots of others that, that are not like that. And I kind of suspect that it may be that every, there's a hyperbolic three-manifold associated with every number field that's not, um, not totally real. But it, it could be right or wrong, but it's a very fascinating and mysterious question. Um, I wish I knew how much time I actually had. I have to look at my iPhone. What? A minute, okay. Um, okay. Another interesting structure is to try to understand another thing I think we'll be trying to understand for a long time is how to understand the set of all three manifolds. So just because we know how to identify a single one, you know, have, we have one credit card that's valid, it doesn't mean we know what are all possible valid credit card numbers. We take a random number, you can check if it's valid, but it um, doesn't mean you can just write, give a random number to the hotel and have it work. Um, <laughs> um, so, not that I try, but... Um, so, so, but there, there's a, there are some very nice structures that encompass all three manifolds. One of these is the Dane filling space. Um, and it, there's, it's a kind of metric complex where you can measure, it has these sheets where you can measure the distance from one to another along a sheet. We can, given two manifolds, we can try to navigate within this space to get from one to another. If you generalize it in the right way, it's actually not dissimilar from the kind of space of metrics as Perelman might have um, looked at. I mean, there, there's some things that are, seem similar, analogous to the Ricci flow, but haven't made, been made to work using these combinatorial geometry. Um, oh, skip that. They'll skip this too. The, well. Let's, let's leave, give people some breathing room. Um, stop. OK. So there's time for negative two questions. Anyway.